Step right up. Step right up. It's the crazy cosmos carnival. Come see a diamond the size of a planet. Lay your eyes on an egg with its own moons. You'll see planets where it rains shards of glass and molten iron. Your wish is my suggestion at the crazy cosmos carnival. What a crazy cosmos with Emily Fego from National Geographic. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week we're going to look at what a crazy cosmos we live in, talking about some of the most bizarre objects in the universe. Later on we're going to be joined by Emily Fago from National Geographic, talking about Nat Geo's new work. That's fantastic. Now, you may think that things around your neighborhood are weird, but your oddball neighbor is just peanuts compared to what's in space, okay? Now, starting close to home, sort of, outside the edge of our planetary system, the dwarf planet Pluto is home to a massive heart stretching across much of its surface. This Tampa Regio was first seen in images taken by the New Horizons spacecraft during its flyby of Pluto in 2015. <laughs> also at the edge of our planetary system, the egg-shaped dwarf planet Humea rotates once every four hours, faster than any other known lar large object in the solar system. Plus it has two moons and a ring. Saturn is home to a massive hexagon-shaped storm at its north pole. The eye of this gargantuan hurricane is 50 times larger than the eye of an average hurricane on Earth. Aye, aye. Speaking of which, our own planet has its own delightful little quirks, don't it? That is a fact that That is a fact that Next up, we talk with Nat Geo's Emily Fago about That's Factastic, new from National Geographic Kids. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Emily Fago. She is assistant editor at Nat Geo Kids Book Team, and her new project, that's fantastic, just came out. You may or may not be able to see it. It's hiding behind me. And uh, welcome to the show, Emily. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the book and what is it that makes it so fantastic? Good question. Uh, well, this book has, there's a ton of facts in this book. It's a nice thick book, um, but it's divided into different themes. So we've got facts about space. We've got facts about barnyard animals. We've got facts about sports. Um, and they're all just in these little bite-sized pieces. So each theme spread has 10 facts. So it's great to 10 facts before bed, or you could read through the whole thing if you're really feeling inspired and ready to go to trivia night. Uh, and this book <laughs> is tailored toward the eight to 12 year old, you know, middle grade audience, but adults love it too. I, I, I gotta say, I, I really enjoy this book a, a whole lot. And, you know, it's like I've spent my life in science and still learning, like, really cool stuff, like, from this book. It's it's pretty amazing. So where did you, how did you go about choosing the the little fact tidbits in, tidbits in here? Yeah, well, we had a whole team that worked on this book. So we had two writers working on it. Uh, we had a researcher, we had a project manager that really helped to uh, everything 
was coming together nicely. And then we had the designers and the photo editors that made it come to life. And, you know, it's always hard to whittle down facts. And even the facts that are in here, they're just these bite-sized little pieces. It's like one sentence for each for each uh, fact. So uh, it's, it's a nice little starting point to have conversations with children. And then you could go dive deeper and do your own research. But uh, yes, this is a really fun book to work on. Absolutely. And I love, I love how much how this is going to come out on video, but I love how it's just put, it's going to come out horrible on video. You know, <laughs> you just pick out, you know. Well, goat, I'm on the same a, page. A, a, just randomly, <laughs> a goat can learn its own name and will come when called. I know. Isn't that incredible? I think my favorite facts are the ones that are kind of showing how animals have such similar behavior to humans. That's, that's a really fun one. Oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, so what, what do you, where do you think are some of the more, some of your favorite, more unusual tidbits oh, of knowledge in here? Um, well, well, this is my favorite one that some, uh, for those who have uh, weaker stomachs may not like, but oh, I go personally for it. Go thought, for it. <laughs> <laughs> thought it was interesting. Uh, scientists have made cheese using bacteria from human toes and belly buttons. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that one's a little bit unsettling. It uh, really is, yeah. Yeah, but I, I liked it. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing about this book that I love is that it's not just, you know, boring facts that we decided to fill a book with. They're really, it's, there's a fight, a very light and fun tone uh, throughout the book that it, it's, it's really fun and also funny to read through some of these. Yeah, yeah. And um, so your mom, as I understand it, was an elementary school teacher, or maybe still is. And how did that affect your, your upbringing and bringing in your journey into a life of education and fun? Yeah. So my mom, she became a teacher when I was a little bit older, but she's always been very uh, like a teacher at heart. She was always helping me with my homework and encouraging me to, you know, learn about the world around me and same with my dad. Um, so I was very fortunate to have two parents that definitely valued education in and out of the classroom. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been an incredible experience, kind of us both working on the same thing, but in different ways um, mm -hmm. with her teaching directly to students in the classroom. And sometimes me creating, uh, not creating, but being a part of creating uh you know, curriculum adjacent material, or maybe way out there that it's not exactly something that you would have uh, part of the curriculum, like these different jokes and things that we have going on. But um, yeah, it was, it's been incredible to, to be a part of that educational aspect for children in a different way, like my mom. Right, right. And one of the things I love is, you know, that this, that fun education, is I think ideal for as you say curriculum adjacent materials you know Absolutely. you could have you know I think that you know classes and this sort of you know more didactic you know um way of teaching has its place and you know you get a lot of great knowledge from that but fun but fun education really brings something special to learning I think Absolutely. Having the, the fun, the fun aspect to learning is very important. And also that firsthand experience and like getting out and exploring. And I think that that's what I love about this book is there's facts from all around the world about all these cool places right. you can visit. But there's also things that you can learn right in your own backyard. And I think that that's really, you know, at its core, our mission at National Geographic is to inspire creativity and curiosity but also to explore. And um, so that part of learning too, learning outside of the classroom in the physical world and, you know, being able to spit out some fun facts while you're doing it isn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Last few days I've just been, you know, sitting, you know, sitting there like with the book on the kitchen table, my wife will walk past and, you know, I'll just be like randomly, do you know giraffes at the Taranga Zoo in Sydney, Australia was, were given reefs covered in foliage and apples as a Christmas tree? <laughs> now you know. <laughs> now you know. And knowledge is power. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So it's great. It's great for, you know, imagine then an eight year old coming up to you and saying the same thing. It's just these great bite sized pieces that kind of just stick in your brain because they are so kind of out there. These are the more like 
lesser known facts and they're they're not your traditional like fact book again they're fun and light but they're a little bit outrageous some of them that you wouldn't even think about um so yeah that's that's a fun one absolutely and you know i have dedicated my professional life to tearing down barriers to sci great science education to take you know to take you know great science but distill it down to a point where people really enjoy and love learning. And I think that uh, I think that when the book that books like this just being so, you know, being so flexible in the way that you can read it, you know, and you can get something out of it in one or two sentences. And I, I think that's really a great way to engage reluctant readers. Absolutely. And I also think just the pure variety in this book. Everyone's going to have their favorites. You know, you've got sure. kids that just love sports. They're going to love the basketball, the soccer, the baseball. But you can also stumble upon some areas of interest that they might not have known that they had, like the space or the whole page that we have dedicated to cheese. So, you know, I, I think- <laughs> That may be among really, my favorite pages. <laughs> that is my favorite page. Uh, so I think that, that too, it's not just- one theme that we have in this book. It's just, it's not all about sports facts, not all about space facts. We have a little bit of everything. So you never know what area of interest you'll stumble upon. Right, right. And one of the things I love about kids is the fact that they are natural born scientists, mm -hmm. you know, and they're always asking questions that, you know, why is the sky blue? Why does the sun make things warm, you know? How come I can't jump off the roof with this <laughs> with this pair of this bird Halloween bird costume I have on? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> but but uh, I, I think for far too many people, um, they lose their interest in the cosmos as they become as they grow older. Why yeah. do you? Why do? You, what do you think happens, and how do we, how do we change that? I think that is an excellent, first of all, excellent observation. And I think the same thing that kind of as a kid, we were always asking those why questions, maybe too many questions that your parents might not be able to answer and it might be a little overwhelming. Um, but yeah, as adults, we have those blinders on where we kind of just accept the world for how it is and we just go about our life and don't wonder why the trees grow the way they do or the grass is green or any of those things because we've just accepted it for how it is. But right. asking, like re-engaging, even me working on this book and kind of re-engaging that childlike curiosity has been a very transformative experience. And it's just, um, I'm very lucky that I've stumbled upon a field that I can just do that in my work day uh, and have these fun facts filling my day. Um, but I think it's really important for parents, first of all, to engage that childlike curiosity by mm. entertaining those questions with their kids, even if they don't have the answer find it together, do that research together. And it could be a fun experience for the both of you. And, uh, you know, if you don't have kids, you can still enjoy this book. I enjoy it. Uh, and uh, I think it's just really important to continue, just like you're saying, to have that questioning and curiosity just about your everyday world. You don't need to go on a plane and fly across the world to explore and have that curiosity. It could happen right in your backyard. Yeah, especially with technology today. Yeah. It can be just so immersive and you know, 3D environments, and um, how do you see technology influencing kids' science education in the coming years? There's so, so many, so many advances now, especially with generative AI, and oh, the, yeah. the well, background behind me was just created yeah. with generative AI a few minutes ago. Yeah, well, you know, when I, I've gone into my mom's classroom a few times, so she's third just talking to the, she was part of a robotics club and talking to these kids about things that I would have never thought to, you know, study. And like, I just, they're way beyond. Kids are so smart these days to have access uh, to that information. Um, but I also think that sometimes having those answers at the ready isn't always the best thing. It's kind of fun to ponder, you know, even just pulling one of these, these questions out of context and kind of pondering a little bit, why is it that way? And having that conversation before looking up the answer is all, right. you know, flexing 
relaxing your mind, your brain a little bit is also really important. So definitely utilize that technology. Kids are incredibly smart and can work things better than I can, um, but not always using it um, right away to get your answer. I think that's really important. But if parents have these kids who are loving science so much, but may not be so much into science, how, how can they... How can they encourage their kids and help them help them in their interests? Help them engage, like help them ignite that interest. Right, yeah. Well, I think it's important to kind of find what they are interested in and then make the connection to science, maybe. So, you know, maybe if they are interested in sports and you know soccer what's the connection between the different things with nature like i one of the facts in here was that tree resin was actually used for the first ball that was ever created so kind of mm -hmm. making different connections with what they're already interested in i think is a great thing mm -hmm. but also again i think that there's nothing like that first hand uh exploration that you could do um just right in your own backyard, no matter where you are. I'm in a city right now. I'm in DC. I can see lovely trees that are sprouting. I see pigeons flying all around. You know, there's nature and exploration and that can happen, happen anywhere. So getting kids out and exploring that, I think is the most important thing that you could do to, to get that interest going. Awesome. I think that's so true. And finally, what's, what's next for you? What, 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 what are you working on now, Emily? Well, there's a lovely book that's actually coming out. It's April 4th. So right now that's coming out tomorrow. Um, but it's Can't Get Enough Dog Stuff. And I think that is just such a fun book. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see that in print. Um, it's got a ton of jokes. It's got uh, diagrams and just different facts. It's it's a really fun book. So I love that series, the Can't Get Enough series. We've got uh, yeah. space and sharks already out. And now we have dog stuff to add to the collection. Yay! That's wonderful. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> yeah. So thanks so much for being on the show, Emily. It was great talking with you. Great Thank fun. Thank you. It was great talking with you. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Great. Great. I'm glad. And that was Emily Fago, assistant editor at Nat Geo Kids Book Team. Check out their new book, whether or not you can see it on this screen. Uh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> <laughs>
These bizarre creatures in space are so odd they probably shouldn't even be called objects. Now, the more massive and dense an object is, the faster one needs to travel in order to get away from that body. This is known as an escape velocity. For Earth, the velocity needed to get away from it all is a scooch over 11 kilometers a second. Trying to escape from a black hole, however, is a futile task as even light. Traveling at around 300,000 kilometers a second is not fast enough to escape its grasp. That's what makes them black. And holes, kind of. Much like all galaxies tend to gather together in groups. These groups of galaxies can sometimes, but not always, join together along with a whole lot of hot gas into galaxy clusters, which themselves can become segments of superclusters. The Lanakea Supercluster, which includes you, me, and the rest of the Milky Way, contains around 100,000 galaxies stretching about 500 million light years from side to side. Uh, perhaps the strangest of all is what we don't see, and that's 95% of the universe. Dark matter warps space-time, bending light and shaping the paths of objects traveling through space. Nearly every galaxy is accompanied by vast quantities of dark matter, regions of gravity with nothing, apparently, to accompany them. This dark matter holds galaxies and groups of galaxies together, yet it cannot be seen. Dark energy, on the other hand, appears as a repulsive force, which for the last several billion years has been pushing the universe apart. Now, dark matter and dark energy have been studied for just a few short decades. Several ideas have surfaced attempting to describe these phenomena, but little is known about their underlying nature. Every star in the cosmos, every planet, every being, and every atom to put together makes up less than 5% of everything we suspect is out there. Dark matter makes up around 25% of the total, while dark energy accounts for the remaining 70% of the universe. The fact that 95% of the universe is largely unknown and utterly invisible may be the craziest thing of all about this crazy cosmos. Crazy. Man. Crazy. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we're going to be looking at how finding E.T. will change us all. We'll be talking with Jamie Green, author of The Possibility of Life. Make sure to join us starting on the 13th of May. Sign up for our newsletter at thecosmiccompanion.com and never miss an episode. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please comment, download, and share your show. Share our show all over social media. You know, you know what to do in the YouTubes, the Facebooks of the world, and tell your friends about it as well. Because, you know, that would be just swell. Clear skies.